Ready to go? Okay. Is this on? Can everybody hear me okay? All right, so welcome to Food is Medicine. Um, has anybody been to the class before? I, I know a few familiar faces, so um, so welcome. Um, this is a class that we do every month, you know, so it's the same class each month, but depending on kind of what everybody wants to hear, the discussion kind of starts to change. So this is pretty informal, so if you have any questions during the middle, stop, ask me, and um, you know, I love to kind of get off on tangents and you know, conversations, so we'll try and get through as much of this um, presentation, the slide presentation as we can, um, but it is a lot of information. So, um, you know, so what, whatever we don't get through, you um, you can purchase the booklet up in, in Dome 1, Upper Dome 1, that has all the notes in it, so it has all the slides in it. So if we don't get to something, at least you'll have access to that. So, um, I love this quote. I always like starting off with this. This is one of my favorite quotes whenever I talk about food, um, that the food you eat can either be the safest, most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. And I like that because, you know, we, we tend to not think sometimes about what we're eating and the effect it has on our body. But I like to talk about foods as either being nutrient positive or nutrient negative. And so the foods you eat are either moving you more toward an optimal state of health or they're moving you away from that. And so what we're gonna be talking about today is kind of the foundation of how does food influence us and how does what we eat influence how we feel. And so um, hopefully this will help provide you a framework to make decisions about, you know, what you should be eating. Because, you know, a lot of times when we talk about food, it's like, eat this, don't eat this. Well, why should we not eat sugar? Or why should we eat these certain types of fats, you know? And so hopefully that's more what you'll get out of today is that framework to be able to better answer those questions so that you can make decisions that work well for you. Because every, everybody's uh, their own individual when it comes to food. So where we're kind of going with the class, we're going to go through three major sections. Um, the first section, which we'll spend about three-fourths of the class on, is talking about inflammation. And inflammation is kind of at the root of almost every major chronic disease. And in fact, if you've ever been diagnosed with anything that ends in itis, then you've been diagnosed with something inflammatory. Because any itis condition, whether that's um, dermatitis, gastritis, um, you know, colitis, you know, that's basically just a term for inflammation in a certain anatomical area in the body. And so, um, so we'll talk about how your diet is one of the strongest influencers of inflammation. Um, then in the, the last part of the class, we'll talk about leaky gut. Has everybody heard that term before? Okay, good. So not a new term, um, but we'll talk about, you know, specifically what is that and then how does that connect in with, with you know, the whole inflammation conversation. And then what, what time we have left, we'll talk about how we heal the gut. What do we do, you know, about it if we have, you know, leaky gut symptoms. So before we jump into all of that, I like to do a little bit of a functional review of the digestive system because most people, if they've ever had an anatomy class, it was probably sometime in high school. <laughs> Maybe you know you've had you know you know college anatomy you know since then. But um, even when you learn anatomy, you know a lot of times you're looking at organs and structures in isolation. And one of the things I love about what we do here at the clinic is we take a functional approach. So we're not just looking at one individual you know, the stomach is the stomach, but how does the stomach connect in with the whole entire digestive system? And so taking that functional approach, um, I like to just kind of review what digestion is and, and how it works. So does anybody know what's the first step in the digestive process? Mouth, mouth is, yes, technically you cannot start digesting food until it is in your mouth. But I always like to, to kind of, you know, uh, maybe, you know, ask the question of, you know, is there something maybe prior to that step that influences our digestion? Is there something else, the what? 
our sensory system. So smell. So yeah. So smell. You know. So uh, eat, smell. Our visual system. You know. So if you see, you know, like a big plate of cookies, and you smell the big plate of cookies, you're gonna start salivating. So your body's already preparing digestion just based on the visual cues, and that's important because we'll talk about, you know, you know where that starts to come into play a little bit later on in some of our food choices. Um, but yes, once you actually put food in your mouth, you have digestive enzymes in your saliva that help us start breaking down carbohydrates. Um, so that actual digestion starts in the mouth and, you know, of course, we're chewing, breaking down food that way. So then we swallow food and it goes down the esophagus into the stomach. And the stomach, I feel like, is, is one of the most underappreciated organs in the body, you know, because a lot of times we don't really quite understand exactly what the purpose is, you know, because one of the most common symptoms and one of the most common medications that people take today are over-the-counter acid blockers because everybody has reflux, you know. So the assumption is if you have reflux, we've got to quell down all that, that, that acid. Um, when in reality, that's another symptom. It's the body trying to communicate something. So the stomach is one of the few places in the body where it is appropriate to have an acidic environment. And in fact, you want an acidic environment because that's what breaks down all your proteins. It's that acid that digests proteins. And if you don't break down your proteins well enough, you know, that is one of the contributing factors to leaky gut and, you know, the development of food sensitivities and food allergies. So, um, you know, when you have the symptom of reflux, the two main reasons why I see people have that that are not necessarily related to the fact that they have too much acid is inflammation. You know, so they're eating a food that they're sensitive to that's creating inflammation, which creates that, that symptom of reflux. But ironically enough, the second biggest reason why people have have um, the symptom of reflux is they actually have too little acid in the stomach. And so the, the reason for that is, you know, everything in the body is a series of feedback mechanisms. And so in the stomach, when food kind of enters the stomach and the stomach starts stretching, um, the body starts releasing acid to help us digest. Well, once you've kind of reached capacity and once the acid has gotten to a certain level, that then signals the body to shut this what's called your lower esophageal sphincter and it's kind of like closing off you know the the that gateway between the esophagus and the stomach and that is what keeps all the contents of your food in the stomach while it's churning and while that acid is breaking that food down so what happens for a lot of people is acid levels actually stay too low and so that mechanism to trigger that sphincter to close doesn't happen. So it stays open, they get the symptoms of reflux, they feel burning, they have burping, and they go to their doctor and their doctor is like, well, you need to go on Prilosec, which is actually, in fact, the worst thing that they could do because they already had low stomach acid. And that's why, you know, maybe it helps for a little bit, but then, you know, a few months later, they have to up the dose again because it's not helping anymore. So, um, you know, so addressing stomach acid is something that I very, very commonly see in patients, especially patients who have have hypothyroidism. So if you are on thyroid meds, that is that is that very often goes hand in hand with um, low stomach acid. So then after the food, after the stomach, you know, churns and you break down all those proteins, you know, then the, the contents of the stomach start to go into a part of the small intestine called the duodenum. And that's a really important step in the digestive process because that's where the pancreas starts dumping digestive enzymes. Has everybody heard about, you know, some people take digestive enzymes prior to a meal? Well, we make those enzymes naturally, and it's the pancreas that's making them, and this is the spot where, you know, a lot of those digestive enzymes are dumped. Well, if your stomach acid is too low, the hormone that triggers the release of stomach acid also triggers the pancreas to release these digestive enzymes. So if stomach acid's low, chances are your digestive enzymes are also going to be, you know, on the lower side. So you kind of have a double whammy there as far as digestion goes. Um, there are some people that, uh, whether it's genetic or environmental, they just don't make enough of some of their digestive enzymes. And so, um, you know, so some people do, all, you know, better just supplementing with, with those enzymes. And probably actually the most classic example of that are people who are lactose intolerant. 
you know, somebody who's lactose intolerant doesn't make enough of the digestive enzyme lactase. So they have a hard time breaking down milk proteins. So anytime they have, you know, milk proteins, they, they don't get broken down. And so it creates a lot of, you know, digestive issues, bloating, cramping, um, you know, diarrhea symptoms for them. And so, but we have not only the lac lactase enzyme, we've also got enzymes that help us break down our fats, lipases. We have enzymes to help us break down carbohydrates like our amylases. And we also have, you know, certain ones to help us break down our proteins as well. So those digestive enzymes are real important and they get dumped right here in that duodenum. So then by the time the food's been broken down, you've got the digestive enzymes that have continued to break that food down, then it starts to move through the small intestine. And as that food moves through the small intestine, this is where we have the majority of the absorption. And so we're absorbing nutrients, we're absorbing minerals, we're absorbing sugars, proteins, amino acids. You know, so this is, this is where, when we talk about leaky gut, that's in the small intestine, and that's where, where that tends to happen. And so, um, when, when, which we'll talk more in detail about what specifically leaky gut is further along in the, the course. But when you have leaky gut, you know, the, either the contents, you know, didn't get broken down fully or you have inflammation in the lining of that, of that small intestine. And so that creates an environment of inflammation. So that happens there in the small intestine. So that then by the time when the food gets to the large intestine, um, you primarily have waste that's left over. And so um, the, the, the large intestine or the colon kind of moves through, you know, that excess food, the excess waste through. It adds, you know, more stuff that's kind of being dumped from the liver and from the, from the bile system. Um, you add water back in. And this is actually where we have most of our bacteria. You know, so, you know, most of the bacteria that live in our body, there are trillions of bacteria, the good bacteria, a lot of that resides in the large intestine. And in fact, so much so that when you have a bowel movement, about 75% of that bowel movement is actually bacteria that's sloughing off the wall of, of the colon. So um, kind of makes sense, you know, if you have an issue with constipation, you know, look at that bacterial system and that ecosystem and chances are there's probably, um, you know, some disruptions there. So that then you so you like I said you you have waste that eventually gets eliminated. So that's how you take something very appetizing and put it into this system, and it comes out something very unappetizing. <laughs> so um, so just this system alone, you know. And if you get nothing else out of the class, you know, if you can poop every single day, that will change your life. You know, if you're not already doing that, preferably multiple times per day, but that alone makes such a big difference. Cause if, if you're not eliminating the waste, I mean that your colon, some people hold up to 20, 30 pounds of fecal matter in their colon. So if you're not eliminating that waste every single day, that waste is going to get recycled back into your system and you're going to feel really crummy. So, um, you know, so just making sure that this system is working optimally um, can make a really big difference. So does anybody have any questions before I move on? Nope. Okay. So, um, so also one other thing I want to uh, touch on before we jump into, you know, talking about inflammation is, um, you know, a concept, this idea will, will kind of permeate throughout the rest of this talk, but the digestive system, everything I just went through, the digestive system that we have was designed for a particular reason. It was designed to digest a particular type of food, to be in a particular type of an environment. And that, that system developed over thousands and thousands of years based on the diet that our ancestors were eating. So one of the biggest things that has shifted, you know, over the past hundred years is that we are eating food essentially that our body doesn't totally recognize. It doesn't quite know what to do with. And so this, this idea that our digestive system was not designed for the world that we live in to me, that makes a lot of sense as to why we're, we're so sick, you know, a lot, why so many people are so sick these days, you know, because we're not giving the body the fuel that it was designed um, to have. So beyond just what we're doing differently as far as our diet, there are a lot of other things surrounding the, you know, digestion and lifestyle that our ancestors did differently. And all of this influences, you know, our food choices today. So a few things that our ancestors did differently is, you know, they were highly reliant upon their sensory system to determine what they were going to eat. So like I mentioned at the beginning that our senses do have a big impact on our food choices. For them, it was life and death. 
You know, if they were out in the wild and they came across a berry bush, if they did not, you know, take the time to inspect that berry and make sure that it was something that was palatable, it could be poisonous. And if they ate that, that could be their last meal. You know, so they were highly aware of what they were putting in their bodies because it kind of is a big deal, you know, to take something from the outside world and put it inside of us. That's a, that's, a, that's a big deal, but that's kind of lost in our world today, you know, because we can go to the grocery store and pick up anything and assume, you know, it's not going to kill us immediately, you know, at least. You know, we have this kind of false sense of security, so we have a little bit more of a disconnection between the food and what it is we're actually, you know, putting in our bodies. So, you know, so learning from our ancestors, taking a little bit of time to really be aware of what we're eating, um, can, can go a long way. Um, number two, our ancestors spent a lot of time hunting and growing and preparing their own food, which, you know, again, thank goodness for modern conveniences that we have the time to do a lot of the things we do today, and we don't have to spend our entire day hunting and, you know, preparing food. But again, we've kind of flipped too far in the opposite direction where we, you know, now expect everything to be fast. We wolf food down, we eat on the run, and we don't take the time to actually prepare our food and then sit and eat it. Because part of the digestive process is calming down. It's initiating what's called our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest part of our nervous system. It's kind of the opposite. If, if, if you've ever heard of sympathetics, which is kind of that, that, that stressed out, you know, um, you know, sort of part of our immune system, parasympathetics are the opposite. You know, so parasymp the parasympathetic part of our nervous system calms us down, it's slower breathing, and it focuses more of our energy toward digestion. Versus that fight or flight, you know, sympathetic state, that's all about dealing with an immediate stress. And so, um, so number three, meats and sweets were a luxury for our ancestors. You know, so especially when it came to sweets, you know, sweets were available in the form of fruit. And fruit was only available during certain times of the year, certain seasons. And so our biochemistry today still reflects this because a lot of the sweets they got, like I said, were fruit, which is high in something called fructose. And the way our body processes fructose is very different than other sugars. And so with fructose, we store about 75% of the fructose we eat as fat which was a huge advantage for our ancestors, you know, to gorge on fruit when it was available, store a lot of that fructose as, as fat so that they had something to sustain them over the winter time. Whereas for us today, we've got kind of a constant steady stream of fructose all the time, which I believe is part of the reason, you know, we have such a, such a high obesity rate, you know, here in America. And if you want more detail about that, I just gave a lecture about two months ago all about sugar. And I talk in detail about fructose and how the body processes that differently. So you can actually watch that on our YouTube channel. Um, but definitely would recommend going back and watching that. Um, the number four, the quantity of food our ancestors ate was less than what we eat today. You know, we kind of have this idea that we have to have three square meals a day and we're kind of constantly eating. And, you know, that's just not true. And in fact, fasting, you know, actually has some, some you know, you know, advantage is for us, you know, as far as stabilizing blood sugar. And so there's something called intermittent fasting. I don't know if anybody's heard that term before, but doing a little bit of intermittent fasting, which is where you, you eat most of your calories within about eight hours of the day. And so you would say you had dinner at, at six o'clock. You wouldn't eat anything until about noon the next day. Just drink water. And then when you break that fast at noon, you have something that's high in good fats, high in protein, and high in fiber, and very low in sugar. And that sort of, of fasting, it kind of gives your body a little bit of a break. You know, it allows your body to catch up with detoxifying, allows your digestive system to eliminate. And for a lot of people, they, they really feel pretty good doing that, that, that period of, of fasting on a regular basis. Okay, so now we'll kind of jump into all of this. You know, this is, this is kind of the million dollar question and this is what we'll be talking about kind of the rest of the class that, you know, what has changed in our modern diet that makes us so sick? You know, a lot of us have grown up in a world where all we've ever known is the diet that we have, where we go to the grocery store and you get food. You know, you go back a couple generations, like my, my grandma's generation, she grew up on a farm here in Kansas and they prepared a lot of their, their stuff, you know, from scratch, you know, from the farm. And 
and grew a lot of their food. So, you know, the modern diet, you know, we are now, you know, my generation, my kids' generation has become so far removed from that sort of a diet that what we eat now is considered normal. You know, and in fact, it's interesting if you go into a classroom with, you know, of kids today and you ask them, you know, well, where do carrots come from? You know, it's like they have no concept that that carrot you have to pull out of the ground, you know, and eat. They just think you get it at the grocery store. And so, you know, so that sort of modern diet, that mentality, um, you know, there are a lot of things that are encompassed within that sort of a diet that contribute to sickness, but there's kind of one concept that connects all of those ideas. And that's the idea that it's creating inflammation in the body. And inflammation, this is such an important you know, idea to understand, you know, because typically when we think of inflammation, we think of kind of negative connotations. You know, I mean, what do you guys think of when I say inflammation? What comes to mind? Pain, pain. yeah, pain, uh, maybe swelling, heat. You know, a, a lot of times we have these negative connotations with inflammation. But in reality, inflammation is a very necessary process in the body. Because if you break it down to a very, very simplified explanation, the job of inflammation in the body is to break down damaged tissue when we have an injury. So for instance, if you sprain your ankle, it's a very appropriate response for that to swell up, for it to get red, for it to be sore. That's an inflammatory response. And that's the body kind of going in there, you know, and it's starting to clean up all that damaged, you know, tissue so that the body can come in behind it and heal. So that's an example of, of what we would call a healthy inflammation, a healthy inflammatory response, you know, where it's localized, so it's kind of in one area, it's visible, we can, we can see it, we can feel it, and it's acute. And that acute, that's probably the, the most important, you know, piece to all of this. You know, when you have an inflammatory response, yes, you want it, and yes, it's necessary, but you also want it to go away. You know, that's why we ice that ankle, you know, and that's why we wrap it up, you know, to decrease swelling and we, we elevate it because we want to get that inflammatory response out of there so that the body can come in and heal. So where inflammation starts to become unhealthy is when it's systemic. You know, sometimes we have inflammation all over the body. Um, you know, and that, you know, an example of that would be, you know, a patient that comes in to see me that is maybe seeing me for digestive issues, you know, an inflammation, you know, somewhere in the digestive tract, but they also have joint pain and they also have headaches and they have muscle aches, you know, and you have all these other inflammatory symptoms, you know, that are other places in the body, but it all connects with the idea that they have too much inflammation. So it's systemic. Sometimes it's undetectable. You know, so an example of undetectable inflammation would be um, atherosclerosis. You know, so when you have placking in your arteries, that starts off as an inflammatory response in the lining of the arteries. That's something we don't feel. You know, we don't even feel the placking developing. And so that, that kind of undetectable you know, systemic inflammation you know, can be real insidious because we don't even know that it's there. Um, and then the last one is when it becomes chronic, you know, so that's something like arthritis, you know, there's, you know, our itis, you know, again, but when we have chronic arthritis, you know, when we have chronic inflammation in a joint, that inflammation is doing its job. It's breaking down, you know, what it perceives to be damaged, you know, tissue. So, you know, the long-term effects of having that chronic inflammation in that joint is you start to see deformity in the joint. You start to get aches in that joint. You start to have pain in that joint chronically. That is a chronic chronic, you know, inflammation. And that's, you know, something that we kind of assume is inevitable as we age, which is not true. You know, the inflammation is not inevitable. Now, as we age, it gets harder, you know, to keep inflammation in check, but it's not impossible. So like I said, that, that, that chronic inflammation is speeding up wear and tear sometimes of our organ systems. And um, what's, what's causing that un, uh, unhealthy inflammation is not only having too much inflammation, but it's also not having enough of the, of the mediators that turn off inflammation, those anti-inflammatory mediators. So in a perfect world, you know, we have things that, that turn on inflammation and we have things that turn off inflammation in the body. And in a perfect world, we would have equal amounts of both of those. And as long as we have equal amounts of both of those, the body can turn on inflammation when it's needed and turn off inflammation when it's not needed anymore. But what happens for most people in our world today is they look like this. So they have too many of the things that turn on inflammation 
and not enough of the things that turn off inflammation. So an example of kind of what this looks like practically for a lot of people is if you had two people that went out for an eight mile hike. One of those people is in this sort of a state. They're in a balanced, you know, pro they have the pro-inflammatory mediators balanced with the anti-inflammatory ones versus the other person is in this sort of a state where they have way more of these pro-inflammatory mediators, not enough of the anti-inflammatory. So both people go out and hike eight miles, which hiking eight miles is gonna create stress. It's gonna create wear and tear on the body. So after they hike the eight miles, the person who's in this imbalanced sort of state is gonna be really sore that night after they hike, and then they're gonna be sore for a week after that hike, you know, so that inflammatory response gets turned on and they don't have enough of the anti-inflammatory guys to turn it off, so it sticks around a lot longer than it should. Versus the person who's in a healthy inflammatory state, goes out, hikes eight miles, maybe is a little bit sore that night, but then the next day they wake up feeling a lot better and by the end of the next day, the pain is gone, you know, and the achiness is gone. That's somebody that turned on inflammation appropriately, but then turned it off when it wasn't needed anymore. Does that make sense? So everything we're gonna be kind of talking about is how do we get the body into this balanced inflammatory state? And the more balance we can get with our inflammation, the, the more that's gonna decrease our risk of some of those chronic inflammatory diseases that we see. And what, you know, what, what I was talking about with age, when we're young, you know, pretty much up until about the age of 30, it's much easier for the body to maintain this sort of balance, you know, because, you know, young people are just made to heal. You know, it's like you, they get injured and it's like they just bounce back very, very quickly. And as we age, it gets a little bit harder and harder to maintain that balance, but it's not impossible. All right, so what does inflammation have to do with the diet? What is it we're doing in our diet that creates that imbalance in, 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 in the inflammatory response in the body? So to answer that question, um, like I mentioned in the beginning, we're gonna look at how the diet has changed. You know, starting with kind of the ancestral diet, which this is what I mentioned, you know, our ancestors ate for thousands and thousands of years before we started shifting things, you know, before we started introducing more grains into the diet, before we started introducing more processed food into the diet, and then where we're at today where we have a lot of not only processed food, a lot of chemicals, and a lot of preservatives that are added to our food. You know, how has each of these major shifts, how has that changed inflammation in the body? And so that's what we're gonna look at. And I'll point out too, I have some book recommendations. This one right here is one of my absolute all-time favorite health books. It's called The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. And he's just fabulous. He's just a fabulous writer. And he talks a lot about this, the, the, the big dietary shifts that have happened in how that has changed, you know, our, our health, you know, over the past couple hundred years. All right, so the four major things that we're going to look at that influence inflammation in the diet are we're going to look at what percent of our diet comes from a whole food. We're going to look at the ratio of omega-3 to 6 fatty acids, the glycemic index, and the ORAC score. So I'm going to go through what each of these things are because each of these four factors has a profound impact on the, the production and release of, of, of inflammation in the body. So number one, this concept, um, eating whole foods. This, again, if you tune me out the rest of the class or you have to leave early, as long as you understand this slide right here, and implement it, you will be good. You know, this, this, I always say, you know, maybe it's the Catholic in me, but this covers a multitude of sins. You know, if you can just do, you know, this correctly, you know, you know, you will take care of most of the mistakes that people make when it comes to, you know, poor food choices. So, um, so eating whole foods is eating food in its original state. So kind of as food was designed by nature, you know, if you can eat 80% of your diet in a whole food state, you are gonna be doing better than majority of the population you know, in our world today. And so to eat a, a whole food, I have one example here. Um, you know, eating a whole food is like eating an apple. You know, an apple has all the fiber, all the nutrients, everything packaged up in this nice, neat little, you know, you know, container that we can eat, you know, that, um, you know, is, is, you know, the quintessential whole food. Now, if you take that apple and you peel it, you cook it, you add some cinnamon and sugar, you would, you could make applesauce. 
which is not a bad food choice. You know, I give my kids applesauce all the time. But one thing you have to recognize is that applesauce is one step away and it doesn't have all the nutritional value that eating that apple would have. So then if you take that, you know, that apple and you go a few steps further and you just juice out the juice of the apple, again, still going to have some nutritional value to it, but you're missing all the fiber and you're missing, you know, a lot of the nutrients. And so apple juice is, you know, even further away from that original apple to begin with. So the mistake that in, in the modern world, especially with all the processed foods that we eat, the mistake we make is we eat a lot of foods that are kind of in this area right here that are much more devoid of nutritional value than if we just ate that apple to begin with. And so now what's, what's, what's even more scary is a lot of times when we eat like say applesauce and apple juice, you know, we have a tendency of like patting ourselves on the back saying, you know, I made a, I made a good food choice, which, you know, if you're choosing apple juice over, you know, a Coca-Cola, then yes, that was absolutely a much better food choice. But don't trick yourself into thinking that eating, you know, that drinking apple juice is the same thing as having a serving of fruit because it is very different. And in fact, most people who are not health conscious are eating foods that probably don't even fall on this scale of being, you know, anywhere close to a real food. You know, I, I always joke that, you know, if something like McDonald's French fries, if you can leave them sitting out on the table for more than a month and they don't change, like that does not fall on this scale right here. That's like way over on the wall over there, you know. And so if we can shift more back toward getting the majority of our diet just from whole foods, from real food, then that's, that's the only nutritional guideline you need to follow. Because if you do that, you're going to be eating fruits and vegetables, you're going to be eating proteins, you're going to be eating nuts and seeds, you're going to be eating good quality fats, um, you're not going to be eating processed crackers, you're not going to be eating you know, processed you know, canned foods. You know, so you, all of the stuff that we should really be you know, eliminating gets eliminated if we just try and stick with a real food diet. So some people ask, you know, well, what does that look like in a day? You know, if you were to try to shoot for, you know, an 80, 20 or 90, 10, you know, getting 80% of whole foods might look like for breakfast. Um, one of my favorites is scrambled eggs and spinach. So scrambled eggs and spinach, and then maybe you do half of an avocado with that, or you put a little bit of guacamole on top of that, homemade guacamole. Um, and then lunch, you have a big salad. You know, again, hard-boiled egg on top, you know, maybe some, some tuna, maybe some pistachios, you know, a nice olive oil-based dressing, um, you know, and have a real big hearty salad for lunch. Or maybe you do a smoothie, you know, where you have frozen berries, handful of spinach, flax seeds, almond milk, you know, all of that, you know, could, you know, would be a you know, totally 100% whole foods meal. And then dinner, maybe you want to splurge with dinner a little bit. And so maybe you still have some chicken with some, you know, quinoa or rice or some you know, sweet potato. And then you know what? You've been good all day long. So you've got 20% left. Maybe you have a little bit of ice cream or something, you know, or some dark chocolate, you know, something, you know, that 80-20 still allows you to have that 10 to 20% of splurging on something. But really the focus is more on getting that 80%. And then with that 20% left over, you can kind of play around with that. Yeah, did you have a question? So a smoothie, no, the question was, is, is a smoothie altered? And just blending it up, if you're throwing the whole vegetable, the whole fruit in there and, and just blending it, then yes, that would still be considered, you know, a whole food. Whereas if you juice it, you lose. If you juice it and you're taking out the fiber, then, I mean, there's a question, I mean, if, you're, it's a, if it's a fresh juice, you know, like a, you're, you're juicing it yourself and drinking it right away, that's going to be way more nutritious than buying, say, apple juice at the store. But technically, you're taking away a lot of the fiber, you know, from it. So it's not as whole of a food as if you did the whole thing in a smoothie. So, but again, not a bad. I always like to think of food choices as there's a good, a better, and a best choice. And Always making a better choice is, is, is a great move to make. You know, like, like I said, I would so much rather people who are eating at Chick-fil-A to get the, the applesauce for their kids rather than the big thing of fries. You know, that is making a much better choice. Now, in a perfect world, you'd be baking chicken at home and having, you know, making stuff from scratch, but not always possible for people. And so as long as you're kind of constantly moving toward making better choices, then you're on the right path. So... 
So, so I would never get down on somebody for juicing, you know, fresh beets and spinach and say, well, that's not a whole food. You know, I would never, never do that. So. So this right here, like I said, shoot for 80-20 minimum, 90-10 if you want to be, you know, even better um, of, you know, getting whole foods in your diet. Is there, I can't remember exactly what it is, but I read something about juicing that you actually can get more minerals out of greens if you juice them yourself. Yeah, so the, yeah, so the question was, can you get more minerals and nutrients? Um, we're doing this online, so I repeat the question for those who are following us online. Um, but you can get more nutrients juicing, and, and that is correct. You know, it, it kind of depends on your intention because when you, when you take away the fiber like that, fiber slows down digestion, and so in some regards, like for instance, if you were just juicing, say, apples, apples have a lot of sugar in them, so if you took away that fiber, you know, you're going to still spike your blood sugar even with fresh-squeezed apple juice. But if you're, say, juicing stuff like spinach and beets and kale and ginger, you know, stuff like that that has a much lower glycemic index, then even taking the fiber away, you're still not going to spike your blood sugar as much. And you'll more quickly absorb the nutrients and you can get more nutrients in because, you know, you could juice, say, 10 carrots and drink, you know, get a lot of the nutrients in 10 carrots. Whereas if you sat down and tried to eat 10 carrots, like you probably wouldn't be able to eat that many at a time because there's too much fiber in them. So kind of depends on why what your intention is for for juicing and that's where it can definitely be a, a really great option for people who need that that high concentration of nutrients all right so the next thing the second thing we're talking about here is um, looking at essential fatty acids so I apologize for the biochemistry this is the only biochemistry slide in the, the presentation but I, I love this I love this this description because a lot of times when, when I'm you know counseling people in nutrition this is some of the stuff that's going through my head and so the big nerd that I am and so I like to show this slide in particular because what we're looking at here are like I said essential fatty acids and Essential fatty acids, these are the fats that we have to get in our diet. We cannot make omega-3s and omega-6s without getting, you know, them in our diet. So when we eat these foods, for instance, um, omega-6s tend to come from plant-based foods, plant-based oils. So, you know, we get a lot of omega-6s from stuff like um, corn oil, safflower oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil. Those are foods that are high in omega-6 fatty acids. Um, and so uh, these are the foods that when we eat a lot of omega-6 fatty acids, the body converts them into what are called pro-inflammatory mediators. So these are the guys that turn on inflammation in the body. Versus when we have omega-3 fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids are highest in fish, you know, fish oil, um, but also some plant-based oils like hemp, hemp seeds, chia seeds, um, you know, if you have grass-fed, you know, eggs, grass-fed meat, those are higher in omega-3 fatty acids. And when we get those fatty acids, those get turned into anti-inflammatory mediators. So these are the guys that go around and turn off inflammation. So like I mentioned in the beginning, ideally we would have a one-to-one -one ratio of both of these. But the reason I have the omega-6 fatty acids circled in red is in the standard American diet, our sad diet that we eat, um, the standard American diet is way, way high in omega-6 fatty acids. And the reason being is if you look at these oils right here, these are the cheap oils. These are the ones that are cheap to produce. And these are the ones that are very shelf stable. So these are the ones that they can use when they make the Cheez-Its and the pretzels and all the processed food that they want to last a long time on the shelf. They use these oils, um, you know, to make that happen. These are the oils that we fry in a lot, you know, when we, when we have fried foods. And so we just, as, as a society, tend to way over consume these omega-6 fatty acids and under consume omega-3 fatty acids. And so we end up kind of imbalanced, you know, when it comes to the two of those. Um, now, if you go, again, go back to rule number one. If you're eating 80% of your diet from a whole food source, 
most whole foods naturally have a good balance of omega-3s and omega-6s. You know, so most nuts and seeds have both omega-3s and omega-6s in them. Now some of them have a little bit of a higher percentage of omega-6s, like almonds are a little bit higher in omega-6s, versus something like walnuts is a little bit higher in omega-3s. But, you know, my rule of thumb is this, if you're getting it from a whole food, it's going to naturally kind of balance out anyways, you know. So I, I, I don't, you know, some people, you know, recommend not eating almonds because they're high in omega-6s, which I wouldn't take it that far. You know, as long as you're getting a good amount of omega-3s, that will naturally all kind of balance out. But if you're eating a whole foods diet, you know, rule number one, these will naturally stay in balance. Now, the other thing I'll point out, um, which is why I specifically said on the omega-3 side, grass-fed meat and grass-fed egg yolks is, um, you know, a lot of the, the dairy and the meat that we eat today or that we buy at the grocery store is fed all of these grains. So when you look at, say, a steak that's been, you know, that's a, 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 a corn-fed, you know, animal, their meat is going to be higher in omega-6 fatty acids. They're also, those animals are also going to be more inflamed themselves. That's why they have to give them so many steroids and antibiotics is because they're sick. They're inflamed. And so, you know, it's worth the investment to invest in grass-fed meat because they've shown, they've, they've actually, you know, done the research and, and looked at the, the fat in these animals, which, number one, if they're grass-fed, they're not going to have as much fat to begin with. But the, the fat that they do have is going to be much higher in omega-3 fatty acids compared to this guy over here. So, which kind of to me begs the question, you know, a lot of the, the traditional recommendations is you get diagnosed with heart disease, they say go off of red meat. Well, we know that heart disease and placking of the arteries starts off as inflammation in the arteries. And, you know, if you're eating, you know, red meat that is creating a lot of inflammation, then that recommendation makes sense. But if you are more promoting this omega-3 fatty acid pathway and you're eating more grass-fed meat, that should actually have, you know, more of a beneficial effect on you, um, you know, in the long run. And I will say this, anybody who's a co-learner here or a patient here at the clinic, as part of our new patient package, we measure omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. And actually, even if you're not a patient here, this is one of the tests that you could walk into our lab and have them test today. Um, but, but we look at what percent of omega-3s versus omega-6s do people have. And, you know, regularly, the patients that I see regularly, it's usually tw like at least 20 to 1 plus. I've seen some people that have 60 times the amount of omega-6s versus omega-3s. So, you know, we live in a world today where, it, I mean, this is, this is very, very evident. And I mean, I'll say this, I work really, really hard on my diet and mine's still only five to one. I still have five times the amount of omega-6s versus omega-3s. And so, you know, which, you know, is, is, is still moving in the right direction, but it does take a lot of work to get that ratio balanced. And so I think I've only seen one person who's even been close to a one-to-one -one ratio. So one of the thing, and then I'll move on from this slide, but one of the thing I'll point out is um, you see these little boxes I have right here. These are two enzymes. They're called cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase. And I, I, this one in particular, I like to point out because if you've ever taken an NSAID drug, like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like Advil, you know, you know, ibuprofen, you know, those NSAID drugs, they're, the other name for those drugs is they're called COX inhibitors. And the reason they're called COX inhibitors is they knock out this enzyme right here. So when you take that Advil and it knocks off that, that cyclooxygenase, it, the body slows down production of this prostaglandin right here. So you turn down that pro-inflammatory mediator. So in a sense, you turn down inflammation, which is the point of an NSAID. Well, one thing that's fascinating is that enzyme is also over here on this side, which is this is one of the good prostaglandins, which helps us, you know, it's an anti-inflammatory one. So if you're taking, you know, those drugs chronically, not only are you affecting this pathway right here, but you're also affecting this pathway. And then the other, you know, kind of perspective on that is, you know, Yes, you could take a drug to turn down inflammation, or you could stop eating a lot of the omega-6 fatty acids, naturally slow down production of this prostaglandin, get more omega-3 fatty acids, build up, you know, these, 
and have the exact same effect as taking an Advil. You know, so you know when 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 we say food is medicine, this is a perfect example of that. That you know all drugs are designed to manipulate the biochemistry, but you can do the same thing just by getting your diet back on track and in line. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, not as quickly. No, it's definitely not not as quickly. And you know, it, it, we're all guilty. You know, you go out for that eight mile hike, and you know, popping an Advil will definitely help. You know, calm that pain down. You know, pretty quickly. And so, um, it definitely does does take take time. And and you have to look at both sides of the equation because I have also had patients that start omega threes for inflammation or arthritis, and they're taking a whole lot of omega threes, and they're like you know, my pain's getting a little bit better, but it's not great. And so then the flip side I always say to them is, well, what does your diet look like? You know, because you could be getting a lot of these omega-3s, but if you're still getting a lot of omega-6s, then, you know, you're not, you're not going to improve that ratio as much as you could is if you cut these out of your diet and really promoted that omega-3 pathway. Are there any questions about that? Nope. Okay. All right, so the third thing we're looking at here that connects the diet with inflammation is blood sugar. And sugar, this is one of the other one of my other, you know, big big things that that that, you know, I always talk to patients about because blood sugar has such an impact on so many different things in the body. And so one thing and specifically connected with inflammation is you want to try and eat foods that are low on the glycemic index. Has everybody heard about that, that before the glycemic index. It's basically a scale that looks at when you eat a particular food, how quickly does that food get broken down into sugar and how quickly does that sugar get into your bloodstream? So say if you ate something like white sugar, white sugar is very high on the glycemic index. So if you were to eat a lot of white sugar, what's going to happen is that sugar is going to very, very quickly get digested you know, in the stomach and it's going to very, very quickly get absorbed into the bloodstream. So what that looks like is your blood sugar very, very quickly starts to spike. And when that starts to happen, does anybody know what's the hormone the body releases to help compensate for that? When we, start to, when we start to get a high blood sugar, the body releases insulin. And insulin is the hormone that when, when the body senses blood sugar increasing, you know, the body starts releasing a lot of insulin. And insulin's job is to grab that sugar from the blood and put it in our cells. So the, that sugar can't get into any cell without insulin. Um, so it's, it's, it's taking, you know, the sugar out of the blood, putting it in our skin cells, our muscle cells, our liver cells, all the different cell types we have, we need insulin to get that sugar out of the blood. So that's, for instance, somebody who's diabetic or pre-diabetic, what's been happening is their blood sugars look like this, you know, where they're spiking, they're eating a lot of high glycemic foods, and their blood sugar's been spiking like that for 20 years. And when the body senses this quick spike, what it does is it dumps a lot of insulin because, you know, the body doesn't like blood sugar getting very high because the higher blood sugar is, the thicker our blood gets. It gets more viscous. And, the, and that's an inflammatory state in the body. So when the body senses this sharp increase, it dumps a lot of insulin, which is why, you know, when you reach this peak here and all that insulin gets dumped, then all of a sudden you see this sharp decline because this is where the insulin kicks in and it becomes because the body dumps so much insulin, it tanked the blood sugar to the point that a lot of people, when, they, when their blood sugar drops, they actually go what's called hypoglycemic, where their blood sugar actually goes too low. And this is the, the example of you know, somebody who eats a big sugar breakfast and then 10 o'clock rolls around and they're hungry again, even though they had 500 calories in donuts, you know, their body used up all that sugar and then it, it, the, blood, the blood sugar tanked and then they started to feel hungry and shaky and irritable. And so foods that are high on the glycemic index are going to do this sort of a pattern all, the, all day long. And that sort of, you know, foods that are high, high on the glycemic index, basically anything that tastes really good, it's probably high on the glycemic index. You know, so like if it's white sugar, white rice, white potatoes, you know, white bread, all of those foods are high glycemic and, and those are going to spike your blood sugar like that.
versus foods that are low glycemic, foods that are like your fats, your proteins, your high fiber vegetables. Those foods, because it takes longer for the stomach to break those foods down and it takes longer for the intestines to absorb them because of that fiber, you know, um, those foods, that energy is going to more slowly get released into the bloodstream. And because it's more slowly released into the bloodstream, the body just releases a little bit of insulin over time, you know, and this is where insulin starts to kind of kick in and it kind of slowly brings that blood sugar down so that you could have, you know, breakfast at the exact same time as that person that had the donuts and you could have, you know, scrambled eggs and spinach with half of an avocado and same amount of calories, but you are going to last all the way through to lunch and you're going to get to lunchtime and it's not going to be that, you know, give me something to eat right now. It's going to be more kind of, yeah. I'm ready for lunch. I'm hungry. You know, I can kind of feel, you know, feel that, that, you know, my stomach growling, but it's not that immediate low blood sugar. Sometimes, you know, people sometimes call it hangry. You know, you get so hungry, you get angry. You know, that's, that's this right here. Ideally, we want to keep blood sugar more stable over time. And, you know, some of the, you know, you know, unintended consequences when we're doing this all day long and blood sugar is up and down, every time we go hypoglycemic like this, the body releases cortisol. So people who have adrenal fatigue, you know, this, you know, your blood sugar and your diet contributes to adrenal fatigue. And so for some people to manage their adrenal fatigue, all they need to do is just stabilize this blood sugar. They stop releasing so much cortisol all day long and that their adrenals improve a lot um, just with that alone. So ideally, we want to maintain a low glycemic, you know, kind of steady blood sugar all day long as much as possible. And what happens with people who are diabetic, you know, is, you know, they're on this, this curve all day long, a ton of insulin's getting dumped all the time to where eventually it's kind of like the boy that cried wolf. You know, the body's dumping insulin all the time and eventually the pancreas is just like, I'm done. And it stops releasing insulin. So what happens then is their blood sugar starts to spike, but then it doesn't come down so much. And then it, you know, spikes and it doesn't come down. And then they end up with elevated blood sugar and they end up with diabetes and then that's why they have to take insulin so that they can get that blood sugar out of their bloodstream. So like I mentioned, high glycemic foods, those are foods like sugar, white, white flour, white potatoes, white rice, juices. Um, these are foods, you know, that uh, crackers, you know, pretty much most of the things on the shelf, you know, at the grocery store are going to be higher glycemic because um, they strip out a lot of the fiber because fiber makes things go bad faster. So they strip out a lot of the fiber, you know, for the stuff that's on the shelf. Uh, for foods that are in the frozen section, they strip out a lot of the fiber of that because foods with high fiber don't freeze well. So, um, you know, so a lot of the processed food is going to be high glycemic. Um, low glycemic food is going to be, you know, our whole foods. You know, so if you go back to that, that rule number one, you know, if you're getting a whole foods diet, most whole foods, um, you know, now something like white potatoes is considered a whole food and that would be higher glycemic. But the majority of whole foods are going to be low glycemic. And like I mentioned, there are some consequences. If, if you have a high glycemic diet, one of them is adrenal exhaustion. You know, I mentioned that. The other thing, this is what connects blood sugar with inflammation pretty strongly, is when we have high insulin or high blood sugar, that activates an enzyme called delta-5 desaturase, which if we go back real fast to this slide, here's delta-5 desaturase right here. So the higher our sh blood sugar and the higher our insulin, the more we're going to promote this pathway right here. Because, you know, there are a few omega-6s right here, like this gamma linoleic acid and, and this dihomo gamma linoleic acid, that they have these sides, you know, they can go anti-inflammatory, you know, so they, it's kind of like they do have a chance to be good, you know, but if we're having too much sugar and the body needs more of those pro-inflammatory mediators, you're going to promote this pathway rather than the anti-inflammatory one. And then um, anytime we have foods that are higher glycemic, naturally those foods just tend to be lower in what are called phytonutrients. You know, so they, they tend to be foods that are devoid of color. Like I said, anything white, you know, it tends to be high glycemic. So a lot of times if people eat 
more of a low glycemic diet, that naturally shifts them more toward a higher nutrient density of food to begin with. And so, you know, if you cut out white bread and white rice and white pasta, white flour, you know, you tend to, you know, have, make better food choices. You tend to have a salad instead, or you tend to have protein and greens. So just by eating low glycemic, we tend to make better food choices um, naturally. Which is a perfect segue into our last, you know, connection with, between the diet and inflammation, and that's something called the ORAC score, or basically the color of food. How colorful are the foods that we're eating? Because in nature, the more color that foods have, the more nutritional value they have, um, because it's the color or the phytonutrients that help protect those plants from the harmful UV rays of the sun. So that same protective effect holds true for us when we eat these high color foods. You know, that color tends to protect us as well and has antioxidant effects for us. So foods that are, you know, high in color, like, you know, your greens, your kale, your spinach, um, beets, one of my absolute favorites, broccoli, you know, those, you know, vegetables tend to be higher nutrient density than some of the other ones. Um, versus, you know, with your fruits, you know, look at blueberries. Blueberries have a high ORAC score, you know, and so, you know, so these two, the prunes and raisins tend to be a little bit higher in sugar. So I tend to just kind of stick with these fresh, fresh berries, um, you know, but these sorts of foods are going to give you the most bang for your buck when it comes to um, nutrient content. So, and it, did anybody get the, the, the booklet for the class today? In the booklet, the very last page of the booklet, or we actually have this as a handout upstairs in the nutrient store, we have a guide for making color smoothies. Let me see if I have one. No, I don't have one down here. But color smoothies are one of my favorite things to recommend because you can combine a lot of high color foods in one meal. You know, so you could put mix, you know, blackberries and strawberries, throw in some spinach and some kale, some flax seeds, some coconut oil and almond milk and have a wonderful 100% whole foods high color, high nutrient density meal. And especially during the summertime, it's quick, it's easy, and it's always really refreshing. The the key with smoothies, I think a lot of people we have this like conception of smoothies, kind of like Smoothie King, where it's like frozen fruit and fruit juice, and so it's really, really sweet and actually really high glycemic. But if you make like a, what we call a color smoothie, where you're throwing greens in there and you're throwing um, either some nuts and seeds in there, you know, you're getting some foods in there that are higher in fats, higher in protein, that will make it a meal replacement and it'll also give you a lot of the good, good fats and nutrients that you need. Any questions about any of this? One thing I'll mention, I, and, and I'll just mention this as a sidebar because I don't know a ton about it, but essential oils, does anybody do essential oils? Yeah, essential oils are huge ORAC score. I mean, like way off the chain compared to these. And so, you know, that's one of the benefits of, you know, using kind of the concentration of, of essential oils, you know, under the guidance of somebody who knows how to direct that. You know, that that's one of the reasons why those are such a, you know, powerful form of, of medicine. Yeah. So the question was, are all essential oils created equal? And the, and the answer is no. You know, there are certain plants that there are certain parts of the plant that you want to use, you know, to extract the oils. And so for medicinal purposes, you want to go with, you know, some of the, you know, better quality ones. And so I don't know enough. I mean, I know a couple of companies that, that, are, that are really good. Um, one, you know, Young Living and doTERRA are probably two of the biggest ones that are, um, you know, that have good quality essential oils that I know about. Um, you know, the ones you get, say, at like the health food store, they're not bad, you know, and, you know, if you're just using them to kind of make your house smell good, then it's not going it, to, it's better than, say, lighting a candle, but it, they're not going to have the medicinal effects that some of the other essential oils have, so... Even just applying to your skin, breathing it in, you know, both of those can also be routes of delivery for, for the essential oils. And so we actually, we have, um, we're planning a few essential oils classes this summer. So we'll have people who can speak to them a lot more intelligently than I can <laughs> at this point. So. Um, so, but just as a sidebar, since that is something that's popular, I like to point that out that they, those are just off the chain when it comes to an ORAC score. Yeah. 
Yeah. I try to get really good sales so I can only get it like twice a week. Yeah. And, and spinach also. Uh, it goes bad quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it um, okay to freeze it? To freeze it. Yeah. So the question was, is it okay to freeze the vegetables? And absolutely. You know, and sometimes... I even, if you're buying your vegetables at the grocery store, sometimes the frozen ones have more of a nutrient content because they pick them when they're more ripe and then they freeze them right away. And so, so freezing them will retain the nutrient value in them much better than canning or any of the other ones. The only thing that's a little bit different, when they freeze things like kale and spinach, typically they're blanched first, so they're cooked a little bit, which isn't a necessarily a bad thing, you know, but it just, you know, anytime you cook, you know, you lose a little bit of the nutritional value with them. And so um, that's so the only thing to watch for. So if I'm getting it from the market, it's probably better that I get it from the market and freeze it than I get it from It'll be, yeah, I mean, anytime you can get it from a local market, that's going to be your best option. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, for my husband, I make smoothies and freeze them up just with their convenience. And then that way, if I see something that looks like it's not going to make it to a meal, mm -hmm. it gets blended up. And right. then, that's what I've been and doing. so that way we don't waste anything at all. Yeah, that's a great idea. Steps. Yeah, yep, yep, that's a great idea. And I even do that for my kids. I'll freeze, if I have extra smoothie, I'll freeze it in popsicle molds. And they love popsicles, and so it's like they don't even know. <laughs> they won't drink smoothies, but they love the popsicles. So, but do you have a question? Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, if you're going to use it right away, yeah, you don't have to blanch it. Absolutely. So. Okay, so now we're going to jump in. Since we have those four factors that connect the diet with inflammation, the four factors being, you know, what percent is whole foods, um, what percent of, you know, good fats are in there, how does it affect the blood sugar, and how much color is in it. You know, looking at those four factors, we're going to look at how those have changed as the diet has changed over the past, you know, couple hundred years. So when we start with the ancestral diet, you know, the ancestral diet, this is even a very vague, broad, you know, term, because depending on where in the world our ancestors lived, you know, somebody further north is going to have a very different diet than somebody closer to the equator. But if we kind of group them all together, there are some consistencies as far as they were all eating 100% whole foods. They didn't have access to anything else. And so, um, you know, so when the studies they've looked at, specifically kind of the hunter-gatherer sorts of, of cultures, what they found is that people who ate this sort of a diet rarely experienced degenerative and inflammatory disease. Now, the argument for that with a lot of people is their life expectancy was age 30. So of course they're not going to, you know, experience much inflammation. But this is where it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning, where the only thing that changes as we age is we have to work harder at maintaining that balance of inflammation. That balance is not necessarily guaranteed in kids. I've seen a number of kids that come with health concerns that have high inflammatory markers. Now, what's more insidious in kids is they are not always aware that inflammation is high because they don't feel it as much, you know. And so, you know, but I have very regularly seen those inflammatory levels high in kids that are eating kind of a standard American diet. And young women in their 20s, you know, that, you know, are eating a poor diet. They have high inflammatory markers. And so um, for our ancestors, I think it's more connected with what they were eating, you know, the fact that their inflammation levels were so low. Um, and then when you also break down the ancestral diet, I, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I like to show that with, with the ancestral diet, um, they actually got most of their calories from fat. If you look at, they got up to 60% of their calories from fat. The next highest amount were, was protein, and then carbohydrates were more of kind of a negligible amount of their, their calories. And the reason I like to point this out is, again, our biochemistry today reflects this sort of a pattern in that, you know, when we look at our metabolism, we've 
basically got two forms of metabolism in the body. It's kind of like two different engines to burn fuel. One of those engines burns fat for energy um, versus the other engine burns carbohydrates and sugar for energy. Now, the way the body works is if we give it sugar, it's always going to default to that sugar burning engine first because that is a quick form of energy for our ancestors. That was a huge advantage to them if they had that quick, quick source of energy versus burning fats is more of kind of a long-term sustainable source of energy. So if you take that, you know, you, what we know about the two metabolisms, our ancestors, because most of their, their calories came from fat, they primarily used their fat burning engine. And then when they had access to carbohydrates, then they would flip over versus us today, we primarily use our sugar burning engine because we have such an access to sugar. And because of that, because we don't ever get more into what's called ketosis or burning ketones or fats for energy, you know, we end up, you know, with, with burning our sugar engine all the time, which leads to that up and down, you know, of our blood sugar, you know, which makes us more hungry all the time. And it puts more stress on the body. And so um, if we can stay more in that fat burning engine for longer periods of time, if we run out of fats in the diet, our body can seamlessly start pulling stored fats to burn for energy. So an example of this is at night when we go to sleep, about four to five hours after we go to sleep, our body will burn through all the sugar in our blood and all the sugar stored in our liver. And at that point, it flips over and starts burning fat for energy. So when we wake up in the morning, we are more in our fat burning mode, our fat burning engine. That's why morning time is a really great time to exercise, you know, especially before you eat anything, you know, if you don't have blood sugar issues, because if you can exercise in that period, your body will continue to burn stored fat. And so it'll, it'll, it'll burn your stored fat rather than burning any carbohydrates that you ate for breakfast. So if you can stay in that fat burning mode, have a breakfast that's high in fat, high in protein, a lunch that's high in fat, high in protein, high in fiber, the longer you can kind of stay in that fat burning mode, the leaner you'll be over time. And so, um, you know, so that's, that's you know, again, it re, it's a reflection of, of how our biochemistry developed based on what our ancestors had access to. And so, whereas today, we're stressing that biochemistry because we're eating way too much sugar. And even if we are eating fat, a lot of times we're eating it with sugar. And so, any time, again, we're gonna default to burning sugar first, so all that fat that we eat is just gonna get stored away as stored fat, you know, which is gonna contribute to our obesity. Does that make sense? So a, a book here, I have, Eat Fat, Get Thin. It's a book by Dr. Mark Hyman. Really, really great book. I would highly recommend it. I think we actually have it upstairs. Um, but he talks a lot about, you know, a lot of this sort of stuff and why fat is a much better fuel for most people and how that can affect your lipid levels. You know, it sounds counterintuitive to eat fat to lower your cholesterol, but I promise if you cut the sugar and eat the fat, your cholesterol will come down. Um, so, uh, but he talks a lot about that and provides a lot of research in that book. Questions? Okay, so looking at the ancestral diet, this is the ancestral diet, how the ancestral diet matches up with our four factors here. So for our ancestors, they got 100% of their diet from Whole Foods, not the grocery store, but a Whole Foods source, and um, they didn't have access to anything else. Their omega-6 to 3 ratio, they had a perfect one-to-one one ratio because they were eating 100% whole foods. In nature, things are naturally balanced. Glycemic index was very low because they were mostly eating um, you know, meats and fish, high fats, proteins, high fiber vegetables, um, versus their ORAC score was very high because they were eating a lot of vegetable matter. So when you look at this, this was the fuel our body was designed to run on. And this is what our digestive system was designed to do. And so you'll see very clearly as we see the diet shift why this has become such a problem in our modern world today. So this is, again, things are completely balanced with the ancestral diet. So then we start to go through what we would call agricultural revolution. So with the agricultural revolution, this is, again, not a real distinct time period, but in this time period, you know, this is, um, you know, a diet where, you know, grains start to creep in a little bit more. And probably the biggest thing is right here when we started feeding our animals, you know, more grains. Now, there was an advantage during this time period because it allowed people to be less nomadic. You know, people could stay put for longer periods of 
time. Um, you know, they, they didn't have to constantly forage for their food. So there was an advantage, but it did start to shift us, you know, a little bit more into a pro-inflammatory state. So whole foods, you know, again, down to about 90%. Um, omega-6 to 3 ratio, this is probably the biggest shift now, 5 to 1 ratio. You know, so we, you know, our body, we, we start having, you know, a little bit of excess of those omega-6s. Glycemic index, not quite as great because, again, we're eating more grains, which are higher on the glycemic index. Orex score, not quite as great because, you know, those grains start to replace some of the vegetable matter that our ancestors were foraging for. So not a huge shift. I mean, during this time period, you know, barely, you know, sort of a shift, you know, in the wrong direction, but not, nothing huge. Where the biggest shift happened was during what we would call the Industrial Revolution period. This is where... This time period, again, not well defined, but I kind of consider this period defined by the fact that food became more of a business. You know, when, when food became more about how do we keep food longer on the shelf? How do we make food cheaper? How do we make food um, taste better for people? When all of those decisions started driving, you know, the food industry, that's when we started making poor choices. Because, you know, when you start refining grains and refining sugar, not only does it last longer, but it tastes a whole lot better. You know, so people bought more of it. And so, you know, kind of a double win, you know, for the food industry. Um, when you start separating fats, you know, margarine, again, you can make it last longer on the shelf than when you just had, you know, butter. Um, you know, when you start, um, you know, to, you know, refine, adding, you know, certain chemical preservatives and certain chemical flavors, you know, to foods, again, you're, you're making it taste better, but what's the cost of, of those changes that are happening? And, you know, that's, you know, this time period, I kind of think about, you know, post World War One, World War Two era, um, you know, when you know women, you know, were housewives, and this was the period where TV dinners came in, you know, and there was there was you know a, a lot more convenience food, and for women that was huge, you know, that was a big. You know, I was I always tell this story. My grandma is in her late eighties, and. Um, about four years ago, my husband and I were visiting her, and I was telling her how we were growing tomatoes in our garden, and I was like, Grandma, we're going to can them, we're going to make tomato sauce, and we're going to have it all winter long, and she just looked at me totally perplexed, and she was like, Annie, she's like, you know you can buy canned tomatoes at the grocery store for 99 cents, don't you? And I'm like, yes, Grandma, thank you, you know, um, but, you know, she was, again, raised on a farm with nine sisters that that was what they had to do, and so... For her, you know, that convenience was such a big, such a big thing. And nobody at the time was questioning what is the cost of this convenience to our health. And so that's what I think everyone's kind of waking up to now saying, well, wait a second, you know, what are we, what are we doing? What are we eating? And so, um, so this is when that started to happen. That was when this shift started to happen. And so when you look during this time period, whole foods were now down to about 65% of the diet. And this stayed higher than it is today because people were still eating at home. And, you know, women were still preparing dinner at home. Uh, but look at this omega-6 to 3 ratio. It's now 10 to 1, you know, 10 times more omega-6s compared to omega-3s. Uh, glycemic index was high, much, much higher, because now you're refining grains and you're refining sugar. So that's spiking that blood sugar pretty readily. And then ORAC score is low because, again, you, we're not getting all the, the vegetable matter that we used to. And the vegetables they were getting were canned and processed and creamed. And so, you know, so that ORAC score was getting less. So this is a big shift, you know, in our, in our time, uh, time period and, you know, much more shift toward a pro-inflammatory state. And what's interesting is I think we're seeing in my grandparents' generation the effects of, a, you know, a lifetime of kind of, or maybe not even a full lifetime, but at least half of their lifetime of more inflammatory sorts of foods because, you know, they're now calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. You know, so dysregulation of the blood sugar has a profound impact on the brain. And so in that generation, we're seeing this toward end of life. But in the baby boomer generation, we're seeing this in the 70s and in their 60s. You know, so this is happening, which for my generation and my kids' generation being raised on this, you know, it's kind of scary to think about what's going to happen if we don't change, you know, our ways. 
So then that brings us to today, to this convenience fast food revolution that we are going through today. And today, I think, you know, even in the three years we've been doing this food class, I've even seen a shift that started to happen in this to where I think we are actually getting better. You know, there's, it's, it's a slow progress, but we do have kind of a grassroots movement where things are getting better, but we still have a lot of, a lot of long ways to go with, with some of this. Um, but today we are, you know, still having all this, you know, refining and processing of foods, um, you know, a lot of, you know, things like trans fats, preservatives that the body doesn't recognize. You know, these are things that don't exist in nature, so the body doesn't quite know what to do with them. Um, you know, so, you know, what does the body do when it has a chemical it, it can't detoxify and it can't eliminate? stores it in our fat. And so, you know, so the, the, the fat is a, is a good neutral place to store it up. So, you know, it makes sense that the more chemicals we get exposed to, the more, you know, obesity we have and the, you know, the body needs a place to put this stuff. Um, one big thing, I like to mention these right here, natural and artificial flavorings. To me, this is one of the most insidious things that's happening in our food system that nobody's really talking about. You know, if you look on almost any package of any processed food, it will say artificial flavorings. So it'll say natural flavorings, which isn't any better, you know, than the artificial flavorings. But what this is, is back in the 70s, food companies realized that if they could mimic flavor of foods, you know, flavor in nature, again, has a purpose. Flavor signals nutrient content. You know, what makes a carrot taste like a carrot is the beta carotene that's in it. So it's that nutrient that gives it the flavor. So the food companies, if they can replicate flavor, um, you know, and put it on foods, that's going to make it taste better to us and it's going to make us want to eat more of it. You know, so, uh, you know, you could, a great example of this I, I always give is, is uh, vanilla extract. You know, pure vanilla extract has an ORAC score. It has some medicinal value to it. But they have taken that, that, that vanilla extract and they have made a chemical replication of that in imitation vanilla tastes the same as the vanilla. You can put it in your cookies and you can't probably tell the difference, but you've lost all that medicinal value. But the brain doesn't know that. You're tricking the brain into thinking it's getting something of nutritional value when it's not. So what happens when we eat foods that are devoid of nutritional value, but they taste really good to us, is we want to eat more of them. You know, that's why you could sit down and eat a whole bag of Doritos. Doritos taste great. They are blasted with flavor. But all of that, that flavor is attached to a corn chip that has no nutritional value to it. So the brain thinks, oh, I just need to eat more. I just need to get more of this. You know, if I eat more, I'm going to get the nutrient. And it doesn't come. And with a lot of the processed food we eat today, I think that's part of the reason why we overeat it is because there isn't any nutritional value in it. So um, that's usually step number one when I talk to families about eating healthier is, is eliminate any food that has these artificial flavorings. And if you can kind of stop tricking the brain and in, in over, over, you know, blasting, you know, the brain with all this, this flavor, you know, then you can kind of get down to more of that intuitive nature that the body has to kind of gravitate towards foods that it needs and nutrients that it needs. Um, you know, they did a, they did a study with um, babies back in the 1930s, a pediatrician, when she was introducing, you know, food to babies, rather than just giving them one food or two foods at a time, she would present them with about 30 different foods at a meal, and she would let them pick and choose which foods they wanted. And, you know, for the first week, they kind of sampled all the different foods, but after about a week, each one of the kids started having certain foods that they would go for every single time. They had their preferences, and what they found was their preferences mirrored their nutritional needs. So a little boy that had rickets or vitamin D deficiency, every meal he'd drink a little cup of cod liver oil, you know, because that tasted really good to him because he needed that vitamin D. So if we get back to more of like a whole foods intuitive sort of eating, if sweet potatoes taste really good to you, you probably need them for some reason. You know, if there's something like I hate Brussels sprouts and I'm like, there's probably something in them I don't need, you know, because I like most healthy foods. And so, you know, so it kind of gets you back to that, that intuition that we have. Have. But as long as you are, are overdoing these artificial flavorings, it's really hard to listen to that, that nature in the body. So this is where we're at today. Whole foods, uh, only about 35% of the standard American diet, which 
I even think that number is a little bit high. You know, with a lot of the food diaries that I look at, most people, and especially most kids, are not getting 35% whole foods. Uh, Omega-6 to 3 ratio, 20 to 1. Like I said, I regularly see 20 to 1, regularly see 30, 40, 50, 60 to 1, you know, on the lab testing that we do. So a lot of people are in a pro-inflammatory state. Glycemic index, very, very high because we're eating all those processed sugars, you know, and high fructose corn syrup and, you know, processed wheat. You know, wheat today has the same glycemic index as sugar because they've, they've altered it in a way that it has more starch than it ever had before. So eating a slice of bread is pretty much the same thing as having a spoonful of sugar as far as how it's going to affect your blood sugar. Uh, and then ORAC score is very low because we're just not getting all the fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, so this, this right here, you know, we are way more you know, inflamed than we've ever been. And then all these things that should protect us against that inflammation, we're getting less and less of. You know, so this is, this is the environment in the body that you get the right triggers and pff, inflammation pff, is just all over the body, you know. And, and so, you know, so this is why, you know, we are so sick today. You know, this is one of the big reasons why. So what do we do about it? You know, now that we kind of understand the landscape of what's going on, how do we eat healthy? So I have 14 recommendations here. And if, if this stuff is totally new to you, just pick one or two of these because a lot of this can be overwhelming. So start with one or two small habits, um, you know, that, that you can kind of grasp onto. But if you are further in the process, try and implement as many of these as possible. So, of course, I told you my number one is 80% of your diet from a whole food source. That's got to be number one, and that will cover, you know, a lot of the rest of these. Um, eat more fish, you know, especially cold water varieties. You know, avoid the farmed fish, um, you know, because it's, it's just not good. Um, Grass-fed, you know, meats, you know, make friends with a local farmer. You know, there are a lot of really great farms in and around Wichita even that, you um, Get to know the farmer, know what their practices are, how they raise their animals, um, you know, and that will affect the quality of, of what you're eating. Uh, colorful vegetables, you know, so get as many colorful vegetables as you can. You know, like I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, we're trained to be attracted to color in nature and because in, in, in nature, color equals nutrition. So the food companies know that. That's why M&Ms and Skittles and candy are really colorful. You know, they, it's attractive to us. Like, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to like Whole Foods and they've got the natural M&Ms and the natural M&Ms, they're only like brown, yellow, and orange. And it's like, I find myself looking at those thinking, oh, that doesn't look as good. You know, but it's like, it's totally tricking, you know, your brain, you know, because, you know, we're used to the, the bright, colorful, you know, you know, processed foods, you know, that we get. And which, by the way, it's talking about grass-fed movement or, or the grassroots movement. Um, certain food companies like Nestle buy, I think it's like 2018, they're taking all the food dyes out of their candies, which doesn't make them healthy, but it's a step in the right direction that they're going to be using more natural food coloring agents. Um, so number five, use spices and herbs to flavor your food. You know, just because you're not getting artificial flavorings in your food doesn't mean it has to taste bland or taste bad. You know, use, you know, summer is the time to use your fresh herbs. You know, grow an herb garden. Use a lot of fresh spices. Um, use sea salt, you know, to flavor your food, especially with kids. You know, I encourage parents to, within reason, let kids use the salt grinder and put salt on their foods because especially like the, the pink Himalayan sea salt is going to be high in minerals and kids need a lot of minerals for growth and if you find yourself craving salty foods like going for the potato chips very often that's a craving for minerals which is very often an adrenal issue but let yourself have a bit of that sea salt as long as it's the, the good quality sea salt and it's not table salt you know that will help your adrenals rather than than hurt um, use, um, you know, olive oil or coconut oil, not as much olive oil. You know, if you, olive oil is not great to cook with because it's not a real heat stable oil, but coconut oil is a great cooking oil, avocado oil, walnut oil, sesame seed oil. All of those are good high heat stable oils that you can cook with in place of your canola or your vegetable oils. Olive oil is great for kind of drizzling on top of salads or if you, you know, steam some broccoli, drizzle on the olive oil afterwards. And, and this is another trick, too. If you want to get your kids to eat 
vegetables, you know, fats make them taste good. You know, so cook them in good quality fats, which are great for their brain, and it's going to make it, you know, taste good. Yeah. Is this grass fed with lard okay? If it's grass fed, is lard okay? Um, I would say, I mean, you know, the the, the source of. Yeah, I mean, I would say, yeah, I mean, in, in moderation. I mean, saturated fats aren't the evil that they were, you know, even just a few years ago. And so as long as it's grass-fed, I would say in moderation, yeah. Um, number seven, identify food sensitivities or allergies. You know, this is something that, you know, if you've got a hidden food sensitivity, say, to corn or, you know, something like for me, chicken is the big sensitivity of mine. That can create a lot of inflammation. And you can do this via a blood test or you can do it uh, via something called an elimination challenge where if you suspect corn is an issue, take corn out of your diet for 30 to 60 days and then reintroduce it and see how you feel. Because if you have it out of your diet for a certain period, when you reintroduce it, you'll have a much stronger reaction to it. And so you'll be able to identify Yes, this is something that is a trigger that's creating inflammation for me. Um, number eight of you know avoid you know vegetable cooking oils. There's a whole lot of other better ones um, like the coconut oil that you can use. Um, limit avoid you know refined sugars, refined grains. Uh, limit dairy. You know dairy is one of those that you know some people will say no dairy. Um, I say for sure if you do dairy, it's got to be organic, grass-fed if you can, um, you know, because, you know, 80% of antibiotics used in our country are used on our livestock. So if you are doing conventional dairy, you're getting a lot of passive antibiotics and steroids. Um, but dairy is kind of one of those things, use it as a garnish rather than a main part of your meal. So a little bit of, you know, good quality cheese you know, I think is, is fine for most people. Some people can't handle that, but for most people, it's probably okay. But avoid the cow's milk. You know, there are so many other great replacements, like almond milk. For kids, encourage water. They don't have to have, you know, as long as they're getting vegetables, they are fine, you know, with calcium. They don't need cow's milk. Um, snack on nuts and seeds. You know, so again, nuts and seeds are low glycemic, high in good fats, um, very portable. You know, they're just a great snack to have available. Um, when you're thirsty, drink water. You know, so, uh, you know, a lot of the drinks that we consume are hidden sources of sugar. So try and try and avoid those as much as possible and drink water whenever you can. Or herbal teas. You know, herbal teas, um, you know, are free of caffeine and they can add a nice little flavor to water. And then number 14, eat organic as much as possible, which, you know, I, it's kind of a nice segue. I have just like a little sidebar here as far as eating organic. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that the more we use pesticides and herbicides, the sicker we're getting. And, you know, I know it's not uh, always totally feasible for everybody to eat 100% organic, but if you can switch over as much as you can organic, you know, you're just going to decrease that toxic burden that your body is exposed to. And so, um, you know, you can look at pictures, you know, during the 90s, that was when um, some of the food companies, <coughs> Monsanto, <coughs> started developing foods or seeds that were what they call Roundup Ready, you know, so Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready wheat, to where those, the, the plants that grew were resistant to the herbicide Roundup. So they can spray Roundup all over, you know, those plants, and it doesn't affect the plant, but it'll kill the weeds. So the, the dose that we're getting is, is, is higher and higher. And, you know, they used to, I, I heard that they used to go around when they were trying to sell this to farmers, and the people, the reps would actually drink the, the, the glyphosate just to show how benign it was. And, and it's, it, I think it's one of those things, it's the cumulative effect, you know, but when you look at the 90s, when, the, when you have, we had the rise in the use of it, that's when we had the rise of obesity. That's when we had the rise of autism. That's when we had the rise of cancer. That's when we had the rise of heart disease. And so you can literally lay these graphs over one another. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there is um, a strong correlation between the two. And if anything, you know, just looking at from a nutrient perspective, you know, the way that Roundup works is it's a chelator. So it, it chelates minerals away from the, um, the weeds, which kills them. So if it's acting as a chelator, 
what is it doing in our digestive system when we eat it with foods that are supposed to be high in minerals? You know, are we able to absorb those minerals? So, um, plus, you know, if you eat organic plants versus conventional, organic plants don't have that protection, so they inherently have to be stronger. So they, you know, inherently have more, you know, phytonutrients and, you know, are, are, they taste better because of that. Um, but they are inherently um, just better for us, you know, and, and they taste better. So if you're like us, you know, family of five, we can't do 100% organic all the time. So this list right here is an excellent resource. This is called the Dirty Dozen. These 12 fruits and vegetables are the 12 worst when it comes to pesticide use. So if you only bought these 12 organic, you would cut out the majority of pesticides that you're exposed to. So this is a great list to take with you, you know, when you go to the grocery store because, um, you know, this, these, these foods right here, and, and some of them like strawberries, apples, you know, celery, grapes, spinach. I mean, these tomatoes, these are some of the foods we eat most often. Um, but these are also some of the ones that are some of the easiest to find organic and price-wise are pretty darn comparable, you know, when it comes to, you know, organic versus conventional. And this is a list. It's put out by a group called the Environmental Working Group. Um, their website is ewg.org. Highly, highly recommend playing around on that site because they have not only this list of, you know, you know the, the pesticides, um, but they also have a list of sunscreens that are safe, which sunscreens are toxic. They have a whole section called Skin Deep, which looks at all the different beauty products. You can even, if you um, download on your phone, they have an app that called Skin Deep that you can actually take your phone, you know, and if you find a beauty product, you can scan the barcode and it'll pop up what chemicals are in that. And it kind of gives it a rating as far as how toxic, um, you know, that particular, um, you know, beauty product is. So it's a really, really great website. I recommend, yeah, Skin Deep. Um, these are the clean 15. So these are probably the 15 cleanest when it comes to pesticide use. Again, if you go on ewg.org, they have a whole list of about 60 different foods. You know, so the dirty dozen are the 12 worst. The clean 15 are the 15 cleanest. But there's a lot that are in between those two also. And so um, these are some of the ones, and especially some of the ones like, you know, watermelon that has, um, you know, a rind around it. You know, those tend to be a little bit, a little bit safer. Um, you know, as far as pesticides go than, than the other ones. All right, so that is section number one. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? You know, it's a lot of information. That's why I recommend if you, if you feel like it's a lot, just go back to that list of the 14 different recommendations and just maybe pick one to work on. You know, like for some people, just drinking water, you know, just getting enough water throughout the day. Uh, you know, a good, a good way to, to gauge how much water you need is take your weight, divide it in half, and that's how many ounces you should have per day of water, kind of as a minimum. And so, um, you know, so just start with drinking clean water. You know, you, you know, get, you know, invest in a, in a, in a purified water system. Um, and so, so that you can drink, you know, clean, healthy water. All right, so we're going to kind of move on. We have about 30 minutes left, so in, since there's not any questions, we'll kind of keep zooming through here, and we'll start talking about leaky gut um, and kind of talk about how that fits into, you know, the inflammation we talked about. But um, one thing to note is that one of the biggest contributors to leaky gut is inflammation in the lining of the digestive tract. So... Everything we talked about in this first part of the class, you know, is contributing to this kind of epidemic we're seeing of people with digestive issues and with leaky gut. And um, Hippocrates, who's considered the father of medicine, he said 2,000 years ago, all disease begins in the gut, which is pretty profound considering that modern medicine now is just... You know, the research, if you look up microbiome or if you look up leaky gut or you look up, you know, dysbiosis, all of these terms are just absolutely exploding in medicine today because they're finding that so much is connected with the health of our digestive system. You know, rheumatology, neurology, you know, dermatology, everyone, it's like a lot of it starts with what you're eating. So what we're going to kind of try and work through here is what happens when this system starts to break down? You know, what happens when we have high amounts of inflammation? How does that start to affect us systemically? 
And it goes back to, again, the concept I said in the beginning, that the gut we have, the digestive system we have, is not designed for the world we live in. It was designed for our ancestors and the world that they lived in and the food that they ate. You know, I kind of half halfway way joke that, you know, if we continued on the diet that we're eating, maybe after another thousand years, we would be able to eat Coca-Cola and Oreos and we'd survive off of that and our, our body would adapt to that and we'd be okay with that. But where we are at today, you know, our body is trying to adapt to the new diet, but because it's so different and because it's so poor, we're having a hard time doing that, and that's part of the reason why we're getting so sick. So if you've ever suspected, do I have leaky gut, or how do I know if I have leaky gut, if you have any of these symptoms or a combination of these symptoms, chances are really, really good that you have leaky gut. You know, so of course, if you've got some, you know, digestive issues like constipation, diarrhea, heartburn, gas, bloating. Bloating is a big one. You know, a lot of people are, it's so funny, like some people don't even realize how bloated they are until they cut out a lot of foods and they're like, oh wow, like that wasn't normal, you know, for my pants to be so tight like that all the time. Like that was, you know, me eating wheat all the time. You know, so um, bloating, burping after you eat. You know, if you're constantly, you know, burping, um, you know, especially pretty soon after a meal, you know, that's a good sign you've got low stomach acid. Um, headaches, migraines, very, very often connected with the food that we're eating. This one, you put a big star by this one. Depression and anxiety are huge when it comes to food sensitivities and diet. I see a number of people that are, that are anxious all the time, and a lot of that is they're eating foods they're sensitive to, and those foods are triggering, you know, that adrenal response, and then that adrenal response is creating this feeling of anxiety. And so, um, so that's a real big one. Plus, serotonin, which is one of, you know, our feel-good neurotransmitters, 80% of that's made in the gut. So if you don't think the gut and the brain are connected, you know, think again. So these, these mood disorders we see a lot are very, very often connected with what's going on in the digestive system. Weight gain, weight loss, you know, number of people that, you know, again, will, are eating really healthy, exercising, and they can't lose weight, come to find out they've got either, you know, bad bacterial overgrowth in the gut or they've got candida. You know, those sorts of things contribute to, you know, the, the health of the digestive system contributes to you know, our weight gain and weight loss. Um, eczema, 99% of the kids I see with eczema, there's something going on in the digestive system. Most often there's a food sensitivity with that. So eczema, acne, um, hives and rashes, you know, all those skin issues. Skin, skin is almost kind of an outward reflection of what's going on in the gut. And so if you, if you see somebody who's got healthy, vibrant, you know, elastic skin, you know, that's a sign of good digestive health. You know, when we start to deplete the body of minerals and nutrients, some of the first places we see it are hair, skin, and nails because those are areas that are more expendable compared to the brain, for instance. Um, you know, certain, you know, ADD, ADHD, certain, you know, mood disorders, you know, or certain, you know, um, behavioral disorders in kids. Brain fog, this is a big one. You know, again, a lot of people don't even realize how foggy their brain is until they start to see more clearly after improving their diet. Uh, muscle joint pain, again, those are your arthritis and, you know, your myalgias. Those are very much related to inflammation. Fatigue and then allergies, you know, both of those are real big ones. Allergies, especially, you know, like sneezing, you know, histamine sorts of response, people see those very, very quickly when they change their diet. You know, all of a sudden... They feel so much clearer, you know, and that's taking away certain foods that are triggering a histamine response, which is keeping them all stuffy. So if you have these, and I'll, and I'll, I'll note too, just because you don't have any digestive issues doesn't mean you don't have leaky gut. My story is I, for a long time, had thyroid issues and adrenal issues connected with the fact that I was having gut issues, though I didn't have any kind of obvious symptoms of gut issues, but I got up to a really high dose of thyroid and I was tired all the time and it wasn't for me until I gave up wheat and I, and I cut out, you know, a lot of grains out of my diet that all of a sudden I could dramatically reduce my thyroid meds and, I, and my adrenals, I could support my adrenals a whole lot better. So, you know, so it, just because you don't have any of these symptoms over here doesn't necessarily mean you don't have leaky gut. 
So when we talk about the gut, we're going to talk about a few different features here of the gut and what contributes to leaky gut. So first one being the microbiome. This is such an important thing. And the microbiome refers to the bacterial system that not only lives in us, but also lives on us. You know, so we are actually 10 times you know, we have 10 times the amount of bacterial cells than we have of our own cells. You know, so we are actually more bacteria than we are human. And so what, you know, over the years, especially with our ancestors, they developed this commensal relationship with the bacteria, meaning, you know, our ancestors didn't have refrigeration. They foraged for a lot of foods that had started to ferment, you know, on the floor of the forest. You know, so they were exposed to this bacteria, and so it was to their advantage to develop a good relationship with the bacteria. So we are now dependent on a lot of the bacteria that lives within our digestive system. Now we also have a lot of bacteria, we, are, we actually have like a bacterial cloud around us. And this bacterial cloud, this is so fascinating. Um, it's actually kind of like a fingerprint for us. I was just listening to an NPR story about this here recently, where they're doing research on being able to identify people by their bacterial Cloud. So, for instance, all of us have been in this room more than 30 minutes. If we were to leave and they sampled the air, they could tell by our bacterial cloud which of us were here because we all have such kind of a unique composition. And so, and it's something, interestingly enough, that we're kind of given at birth. You know, so when we come out of the birth canal, you know, we get exposed to all that bacteria, you know, all at once. So whatever we get exposed to from mom is, is what we get. And so... Um, you know, so those early, early days of life are very important for developing the digestive system we're going to have over our lifetime, which is why C-section babies have a higher risk of autism, higher risk of obesity, a higher risk of cancer, a higher risk of heart disease, because, you know, they've looked at the bacteria that populate their gut is more what's in the room, what's on the nurse's hands versus what they get exposed to from mom coming out of the birth canal. So some hospitals are actually wiping mom and then wiping the baby's face when they come out to expose them to that bacteria just to help populate their gut um, with actually pretty good success. So, um, so this system is very important. So in our world today, we've got this bacterial system in our gut, and there are so many things in our world today that are destroying that system. So if we look over here, you know, of course, whenever we take antibiotics, when we take a prescription, that's like dropping an atomic bomb to kill you know, a lot of that bacteria. But probably even more so insidious than that are all the antibiotics we're getting in the meat and the dairy that we're eating. Like I said, 80% of antibiotics are used in livestock. So if we're eating a lot of that conventional meat and drinking a lot of that dairy, we're, we're getting a lot of those antibiotics. Which does anybody know why they give those, the cows antibiotics? It's not because they're sick. It fattens them up. Yeah, so they give it to them close to slaughter because it fattens them up, which again, kind of makes you wonder, why are we get, you know, getting so many antibiotics and what sort of an effect does that have on us? And kind of as a sidebar, they have done studies with mice where they do what's called a fecal transplant, where they take the fecal matter of one mouse and they actually implant it through the rectum into another mouse. And they have successfully taken you know, a mouse that was obese and they implant it with healthy bacterial cells from a regular sized mouse, and that mouse loses a lot of weight. And they've done it both ways. You know, so there is a connection there between obesity and the biome. They haven't quite discovered the exact connection, but there is a connection there, which is, could explain why it kind of runs in families sometimes. Um, artificial sweeteners, you know, so anytime you're doing Splenda, Aspartame, Sucralose, NutraSweet, all those artificial sweeteners, those kill your good bacteria. You know, so they've actually, again, looked at studies of, of women that drink diet sodas versus women that drink regular sodas. You know, so that's, there's not even a placebo of not drinking soda at all. But comparing diet soda to regular soda drinkers, the diet soda drinkers gain, it was something like 20% more visceral fat. So the bad fat that packs in around their organs, they gain a whole lot more more fat, you know, just drinking the diet versus the regular. Um, certain chemicals, so chlorine, fluoride, pesticides, herbicides, all those chemicals kill your good bacteria. So um, stress, stress kills your, your, your good bacteria. You know, like I mentioned, when, when we're in a stress state, you know, if I walked out the door and came face to face with a mountain lion, my body is going to go into a stress state. And as part of that, it's going to shut off 
gastric secretions. It's going to slow down digestion because it's going to shunt that blood that is taken up by digestion. It's going to shunt it to my organs and my muscles so that I can fight whatever predator is there in front of me. And um, the way I always joke that you can remember that is, you know, if you're about to become lunch, you don't need to waste energy digesting your lunch, you know. So for our ancestors, it, that was, you know, again, part of their survival. But for us today, when we're constantly stressed all day long, you know, we don't digest our food very well. So it's really, really important since we live in a world that is kind of working against us as far as our bacterial system, it's really, really important to constantly be finding ways to build that bacterial system. So fermented foods are one of the best ways to just incorporate into your diet on a regular basis. You know, so yogurt is probably the best known one. This is a big, make sure there's no sugar in it, you know, kind of the plain yogurt. Um, yogurt's good. It only has, you know, a few different strains of bacteria, so you want to do more than just yogurt. You want to do, you know, kefir is, is a fermented, um, you know, kind of a dairy drink, you know, kind of a yogurt drink. But you can get, like, you know, coconut water kefir. You know, you can, you can make a lot of different, you know, these, these fermented things at home also. Um, sauerkraut, you know, fermented sauerkraut, kombucha. Kombucha is a fermented tea drink that is really easy to make and super delicious. And Dr. Dustin Moffitt, who's our newest naturopath, is actually going to be teaching a class on that here at the end of June. So he's going to show kind of how to make it. And Songbird, which is a local company, they're going to bring out samples of it. So you'll, we'll sample the kombucha as well. Um, miso and tempeh, you know, these are fermented soy products that, you know, the Japanese, you always talk about how the Japanese eat a lot of soy and it's so good for us. Well, all the soy they eat is fermented, which helps them break it down. They don't eat a lot of just regular soy like, you know, people, you know, do here in the U.S. They do a lot of this fermented soy, which is much easier to digest. Um, Bragg's apple cider vinegar, you know, so apple cider vinegar, that's got some of that good bacteria in it. It's great to do this before meals. This is one of the best ways I tell people um, to build up stomach acid is do a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, you know, about 10 minutes before you eat. And not only will that give you the good bacteria, but it'll also build up your stomach acid. You can take probiotics as a supplement, which is a great, you know, great option, especially if there's certain strains of bacteria we're trying to get. Um, but you want to do that in addition to doing all the fermented foods as well. Now, probably just as important, or if not even more important, than getting the good bacteria is what you feed your bacteria. So bacteria lives off of fiber. So these prebiotic fibers that we get from fruits and vegetables are so important for feeding that bacterial system. So this goes back to rule number one getting 80% whole foods in your diet. And if you're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, even if you never took a probiotic supplement in your life, you're going to have a much healthier digestive system compared to somebody who is not eating all that fiber. Because, you know, we naturally have a lot of, you know, bacteria that's constantly, you know, living in us. And so it's kind of like putting down the right fertilizer and that, ba that bacteria is going to grow and thrive. So you want to get, you know, these are some specific foods that are high in inulin, which is a great prebiotic fiber, but really all the, the fruits and vegetables with the good you know, fiber in them is gonna, gonna feed that system. And so that's a really important piece to healthy, healthy, a healthy biome in the gut. I'm going to kind of skip through some of this because we only have about 15 minutes left. Um, this, this slide, I, I like to go, this is actually a pictorial description of what leaky gut looks like. If you've ever wondered what exactly is leaky gut, this is kind of a zoomed in view of the lining of our small intestine. And the lining of our small intestine is lined with kind of one cell layer thick of cells. These are called enterocytes. So in a healthy small intestine, these, these cells are connected by proteins right here. And those proteins maintain a nice tight junction so that when we eat food and food is kind of floating by, you know, here in the lumen of the digestive tract, that food has to go through these cells to get into the bloodstream. So there is, the, the body has complete control over what gets into the bloodstream. 
versus when you get leaky gut, what happens is these proteins right here start to break down. And so now all of a sudden you've got space between the cells. So now all of a sudden this food that's floating by can start to make its way through into the bloodstream and it skips, you know, it doesn't have to go through the cell. So those, those food particles get into the bloodstream and about 60 to 80% of our immune system is here in the bloodstream that surrounds the gut. So it's kind of like we've got an army like poised and ready. And the more enemies that kind of get through, the more you're, you're, you're stressing that immune system to have to take care of, you know, those, those food particles. Not to mention that a lot of these proteins, because we have low stomach acid, you know, those proteins aren't getting fully broken down, so we have partially undigested proteins that are also making their way through. That they're way too large that they would have never made it through this system right here, but now all of a sudden they start to make their way through, and that's the beginning of food sensitivities and food allergies. That's how we start reacting to, to certain foods, is when those larger food particles make their way through in the immune system, starts reacting to them and starts tagging them. Um, you know, and that's, that's, I think, one of the big reasons where we have a lot of food sensitivities today. And it's no coincidence that a lot of the foods that create inflammation, you know, foods like wheat, foods like corn, you know, foods like dairy, you know, foods that create this environment of inflammation, those are the foods we're, we're having all these food sensitivities to because those are the foods that, because they're creating this in, inflamed, leaky environment, they're making their way through and our immune system's reacting to them. And you can even develop autoimmunity where you have something like celiac disease where now you have certain foods that actually, like wheat, that actually destroy those enterocytes and, you know, make their way through that way. So, so this is what kind of leaky gut looks like. And uh, what's interesting is food, or not food companies, drug companies are actually, there's a lot of research right now into drugs to target these proteins because they realize, you know, how big of an issue this is becoming. And so if they could develop a drug, you know, to, to seal up these proteins, you know, then, you know, maybe they could reduce a lot of, um, you know, a lot of issues in the gut for people who have chronic inflammatory bowel disease. But for those of us, you know, in the meantime, you know, just eating a healthier diet will help kind of clean up this system as well. So like I said, 60 to 80% of the immune system is concentrated in the gut because this is an area of vulnerability in the body. So it makes sense to put most of our army right there in that, that area. So what breaks down our gut lining? What is it that causes those proteins to break apart and those cells to become leaky? You know, number one I put on here is, is gliadin, which is a protein in gluten. So whether you have celiac disease or not, this protein has been shown to break down the lining of the gut. Now, some people, again, don't have symptoms of leaky gut. That doesn't mean that they still don't have issues, you know, with leaky gut. And some people, too, you know, when, when you look at, you know, the, the, the lining of the gut, those cells are replaced every five to seven days. So pretty much every week, we have a whole new lining to our digestive tract. So there's this constant breakdown and rebuilding of that system. So you can think about all of these different factors are going to increase the rate at which that system is breaking down. But if you're young, you're healthy, and you're rebuilding faster than that system is breaking down, you might not ever feel the effects of eating, you know, this, this gliadin. And so you might not ever know that, that that's having an impact. But for most people, it's creating more stress in the digestive system. For a lot of our patients, typically the way leaky gut appears is it's not just kind of one thing. It's typically, you know, somebody who's, you know, say had, had a, you know, sinus infection. So they went on antibiotics. And because they went on antibiotics, they started to get, you know, the wrong bacteria growing or they started to get candida overgrowth. And with the candida, they started craving sugar more. So they started eating more sugar. Well, then they started eating more sugar. And then, you know, they, they, they had extra work at strat or, or extra strat stress at work, you know, so this, their stress increased, you know, so it's like all those factors. And then all of a sudden they wake up one day and they're like, my joints are hurting. I've got brain fog. My digestive system is a mess. I'm not pooping. And I don't know why. And it's like, well, a lot of that goes back to starting with leaky gut. And so healing the gut can have an impact on all of those different symptoms that they're having. 
But, you know, like I said, gliadin can cause leaky gut. Stress can cause leaky gut. Dysbiosis. These two, three and four, are two of the ones I see most often, especially in kids, is they've got, you know, the, you know, the wrong bacteria growing. They've got candida growing. Um, certain environmental contaminants, like I mentioned, the chlorine, fluoride, um, antibiotics, all of those, um, you know, can create more of a, you know, an environment of leaky gut. Food additives, preservatives, pesticides, um, certain drugs, like I said, NSAIDs, aspirin, antacids, all of those can contribute to leaky gut. So I'm going to kind of zoom through this because we've only got five minutes left. Um, the only thing I'll mention is that when you start to have inflammation in the gut, like this, you know, if you've got inflammatory bowel disease, like I mentioned, that message of inflammation gets carried all over the body. So it might show up as inflammation in the thyroid or inflammation in the brain or inflammation in the joints, inflammation in the muscles, inflammation in the adrenal glands. You know, so just because, you know, it, you, know you, you, you are having symptoms all over the body and nothing in the gut doesn't mean that there isn't something going on because most of these symptoms what we're finding in the research started in the digestive system. Since so much of the immune system is there, that is a hot spot for, you know, all of the, the beginnings of a lot of these other inflammatory conditions. And in fact, this is actually how Dr. Reardon got started here at the Reardon Clinic. He was a psychiatrist, and so he worked with patients with mental disorders, and, you know, he would treat them with nutrients, and what he found was their headaches would go away, you know, and their digestive issues would go away, and, you know, their skin would clear up, their acne would clear up, and they had more energy. And so, you know, what you found is, you know, by dealing with some of the root causes, all of these other symptoms that the body was having started to diminish as well. All right, so how do we heal the gut? So when we look at healing the gut, of course my disclaimer to this is you gotta look at the individual. You know, they, they, everybody has an individual symptom profile. Depends on how long you've had it, how severe. Do you have autoimmunity, you know, with your gut issues? Are there nutrient deficiencies? And then genetics play a role. So the best program, if you wanna go through this, is to do it with the help of a physician. But I'll kind of outline what my mind goes through when we start working on gut issues. Um, and this book right here, The Disease Delusion by Dr. Jeffrey Bland, he talks a lot about these, this four, the four R's is what they're called. He talks a lot about that in this book as well. But you want to go through, you know, step by step, remove, replace, re-inoculate, and repair. So remove, this is everything we've talked about in the class up to this point. You know, this is, this is the step I encourage you to play around with. Start taking things out of your diet. Take out some of the high inflammatory foods like sugar, like wheat, corn, soy, you know, all of those, those foods that for a lot of people trigger inflammation. Start taking those out of your diet. Um, figure out what foods you're sensitive to or you're allergic to. You know, start removing, you know, the, the pesticides and herbicides. You know, play around with this. This step, and for a lot of people, just doing these steps is enough for them to heal their gut. And they feel dramatically better. And they don't ever have to do anything else. Some people, depending on how long they've had leaky gut, they feel better on this, but they don't quite get all the way with it. And so if, if this isn't enough, you know, that's where, you know, I recommend working with a doctor to go through these next phases where um, replace, where you start to replace certain key, you know, aspects of digestion that might be sluggish. So this is, this, uh, an example of this would be, you know, somebody who has low stomach acid. You know, if you've got the symptoms of reflux, burping, bloating after you eat, you know, feeling really full after you eat, um, you know, that, those are signs of, of low stomach acid versus digestive enzymes. If you don't have enough of the digestive enzymes, kind of the same things, you know, maybe bloating, cramping, pain, you know, after you eat. Um, if you see undigested food material in your stools or if your stools float, that means there's too much fat in them. That means you're not digesting your fat very well. You know, that, those are all signs that, um, you know, you might have digestive enzymes, a lack of digestive enzymes. So if you have these two, you know, low stomach acid, like I mentioned, my favorite um, to recommend is just have people do apple cider vinegar. You know, tablespoon of that. Um, you can do it in water. You can do it in a mixture of something else. Do that about 10 to 15 minutes before you eat. Um, but that, for a lot of people, will help, you know, with some of the low stomach acid 
Um, a stronger one that we use is something called Betaine HCL. And that one, you know, again, I, I recommend using with caution. I've had some patients that start that on their own and they get such severe um, burning that they think that they're having a heart attack and they've gone to the emergency room. So, so be careful with that one. It is pretty strong, but it, it, it's actually replacing the hydrochloric acid um, in the stomach. Um, a real elegant tool is using um, bitter herbs. The taste of bitter on the tongue. When you taste bitter, that stimulates the body to produce hydrochloric acid because in nature, foods that are bitter are usually either hard to digest or they're poisons. So it's, it's, the body is kind of revving up a, a, you know, more of a digestive effort when you have bitter. You know, this is why historically we eat our salad prior to the meal. You know, salads are us usually, used to be, you know, bitter greens, and we put a, you know, a vinaigrette on it, which is a, is a more sour taste that's fermented. We put black pepper, which is a carminative on our salad. All of those things help to kind of rev up digestion. And so, um, you know, so you can get like tinctures of herbs that have a bitter taste and just putting, you know, 10 drops of that on your tongue prior to meals is a great way to stimulate digestion. They don't taste good at all. <laughs> that's kind of the point is it's real bitter, um, you know, but, but that's a, that's a, a nice way to, to stimulate stomach acid. And then digestive enzymes, you can take those supplementally. These are some of the ones, um, but you can, you can take those as a, in a, as a supplement, you know, about 10 minutes prior to eating. Some patients use these, like if they know they're going out to eat and, you know, they're usually gluten-free, but they're going somewhere where they might have a little bit of cross-contamination, they'll take extra digestive enzymes just to help their body digest, you know, some of that a little bit better. Reinoculate. So this is getting all that good bacteria back in the system. So this is, again, making sure you're eating a lot of prebiotic foods, supplementing with good fermented foods or probiotic supplements. Um, but that's getting, you know, building up that, that bacterial system, you know, back in the digestive tract. And then the last step is repair. These are the nutrients that I listed that are extremely important for repairing the lining of the gut. And I've listed these because a lot of the patients we see that have chronic leaky gut or chronic inflammatory bowel disease actually have to do some of these nutrients intravenously because they've got such bad digestion and, and bad absorption. The only way we can get these nutrients in is to do them intravenously. And that can kind of help heal the lining of the gut and help expedite, you know, their healing in the body. And so zinc, zinc is a really, really important one for cells that rapidly divide. You know, so zinc is a real important one for healing the gut. Um, B vitamins, B vitamins you need for DNA synthesis and repair. So all that cell replication that's happening, you need those B vitamins, especially the methylated forms of those B vitamins. Uh, magnesium, I cannot overemphasize how important magnesium is for most people. Um, you know, like I put here, it's involved in over 300 enzyme reactions. You know, so it's extremely important um, for our biochemistry and for healing the gut. And then L-glutamine, this is an amino acid. This is like fuel for those cells that line our small intestine. So, you know, whether you're getting it in, in foods, one really great source I don't have up here is bone broth. You know, if you make your own bone broth, that's got a lot of great L-glutamine in it. Um, you know, but that that is, is a crucial amino acid for healing the lining of the gut. And most gut repair programs have you know, L-glutamine in them. These are some of my favorite anti-inflammatory, um, you know, herbals and, and nutrients. Uh, probably my favorite, fa favorite is curcumin, which is in turmeric. And um, curcumin has a really, really great um, balancing effect on the immune system so that people who have autoimmunity in the gut, um, you know, people who have a lot of inflammation in the gut, Turmeric is really, really important for calming down that inflammatory response. Vitamin D, vitamin D activates over 150 genes that regulate the immune system. So again, if you've got inflammation, if you've got autoimmunity in the gut, vitamin D is critical. And in fact, vitamin D has been linked in a lot of studies 
to uh, lower rates of colorectal cancer. So, you know, vitamin D is such a potent immune modulator. And where we live in Kansas, even if you're outside all day long, because of the latitude we're at and the angle of the UV rays, especially in the wintertime, it's very, very hard to stimulate enough vitamin D production. So most people I see in Kansas need to supplement at least a little bit with vitamin D. Um, glutathione, glutathione, one of my favorites. It's an antioxidant. Um, it's also the body's main detoxifier. And so that's another one that can have a really big impact on decreasing inflammation. Resveratrol works very, very similarly as curcumin. So again, real potent immune modulator and, and you know, reduces inflammation. And then we talked about omega-3 fish oils. You know, we talked about the omega-3s versus the omega-6 pathways and how those reduce inflammation as well. So that, again, for the digestive system is very, very important. So where do we start? You know, again, million-dollar question, a lot, lot of information in the class. So, again, I've kind of broken it down. Five, five, these are my five most important things that I would recommend people start with. Number one, get rid of sugar. Start looking for any hidden or any obvious sugar. You know, like if you buy ice cream or if you have, you know, a Snickers bar every day, start with the obvious sugar. Start reducing that out of the diet. Then start looking through your pantry. Look at all the hidden sources of sugar, and you'll be shocked at how much sugar is in the granola bars you're eating, the yogurt you're eating, you know, all the juice that you're drinking, all of that stuff. Um, it adds up very, very quickly. And the, the rule of thumb I give people is, is you don't want more than, at a maximum, more than 25 grams of added sugar per day. That's kind of the maximum that you're, you know, because most sugar is a combination of glucose and fructose. And that's about the maximum that your liver can detoxify with the fructose. And so if you start getting much more than that, you're going to be putting more and more strain on your liver. And that's going to lead to cholesterol increasing. It's going to lead to triglycerides increasing. It's going to lead to liver enzymes increasing. You know, I've seen in kids non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because they're eating so much sugar. So, you know, so decrease that sugar, get it out of the diet as much as possible. So honey, again, in moderation, you know, when we're looking at good, better, best choices, honey is a much better choice because it's lower glycemic, so it gets absorbed more slowly. It's, if it's local and raw, you're getting, you know, the immune benefits, but in moderation. So I wouldn't go crazy with it. Yeah. Uh, dates. Dates, again, same thing. You know, look at, look at how much you're doing. You know, I mean... Uh, dates are a much better choice than cane sugar or high fructose corn syrup, but again, it's still a, a natural source that has quite a bit of sugar. So just make sure you're you're not getting too much. So you take a glass, an eight ounce glass of uh, cranberry juice. Mm -hmm. That's eighteen grams of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a huge portion of it. Now, there's 25 grams of added sugar versus natural sugars. If you want to be real, like the, the, the guys that are really strict with this that do like the paleo and stuff like I mean, they say kind of 25 grams of sugar no matter the source, no matter if, if it's from, you know, a natural source versus an artificial source. Now, what I'm talking about is 25 grams of added cane sugar in, in, or added, you know, processed, processed sugar. sugar. Yeah. Well, and so. Wouldn't necessarily count toward that, but it still, I mean, cranberry juice, it, most of your fruit juices have a much higher percentage of fructose, so that's still going to, you know, put a strain on the body, especially in the juice form like that, um, you know, to, to have to process. Now, there's also the, the, the idea of the glycemic index, there's also this idea of glycemic load. So if you sat down in the morning, you haven't eaten anything at all, and you drink that cranberry juice that's got 18 grams of sugar, that's going to hit the stomach, be absorbed very quickly, and it's going to raise your blood sugar. Now, if you had that cranberry juice, say, with a breakfast of eggs and turkey bacon and avocados, you know, if you, know, you kind of pair that together, some of that other food mixed together, it's going to slow down the absorption of that sugar. So it's not going to have as much of an impact. So... Um, you know, again, it just kind of, it depends on what your goals are, you know, and what your health goals are with it. So, um, increase or sorry, significantly reduce additives and preservatives. So, try not to buy anything in a box. If you do buy something in a box, look in the organic section, but 
don't be fooled. Just because it's organic doesn't mean it's healthy. A lot of the organic, food, um, you know, like chips and stuff are still processed in safflower oil and cottonseed oil and those, those, those omega-6 oils. Um, you know, so, uh, but those are going to be better as far as they're not going to have as many of the added, you know, flavors. You know, they tend to use more real spices and herbs. They're not going to have the preservatives that the others do. So, you know, the, nowadays you can find almost any natural alternative to any processed food. If you like Cheez-Its, you can find a natural version of Cheez-Its. If you like Doritos, you can find a natural version of Doritos. And moving in that direction is a better choice. The best choice would be to try and eliminate a lot of that altogether and replace it with whole foods. Uh, number three, increase good fats and proteins. So like I said, we've got a sugar engine and a fat engine. If you are getting rid of sugar and you're decreasing sugar, you've got to increase your fats. Otherwise, you're going to end up eating a lot of protein and you're going to be hungry and you're going to crave sugar. So increase your good fats. Feed that fat-burning engine and that will keep your blood sugar stable. It'll make you a whole lot happier than if you tried to just increase protein. Decrease simple carbohydrates, you know, so look at your wheat, your pasta, your crackers, all that stuff adds up in a day. Um, and so, you know, start to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, and then number five, drink more water, you know, so, um, you know, everybody can do that. Like I mentioned, try and get as much water as you can, you know, throughout the day consistently. I usually try and have a jug with me all the time, you know, so that I'm kind of constantly getting you know, a, a good source of, of water. And so um, that way also, I do, mine's 32 ounces, so I know if I get three of those, I'm, I am more than exceeded what I need for the day. So, so that's it. Any questions? For me, like I said, this this presentation is in a packet. It's a ten dollar fee for the booklet, but they have the booklet upstairs that has these slides. It also has a resource guide in the front of it that has a lot of information about you know what nutrients. If you need certain nutrients, what foods are high in those nutrients. It has information about you know certain chemicals and how to avoid certain chemicals in foods. And so it's just got a, a whole lot of resource information that you know I highly recommend. Um, getting so all right well I'll stick around just for a little bit if anybody has any questions thanks you do okay <laughs> sounds good bye I know right I know, I've, I've done this presentation so many times, I could probably do it in my sleep at this point. I, but I, I, I love it though, like it's every time well, things, things come out differently. Yeah.